So good evening, I'm Robert Polito, director of the New School Writing Program, and it's my immense pleasure to welcome you to this special nonfiction forum with Kevin Young. We are all familiar with Kevin's singular work as a poet, his seven original and daring books of poems, ranging from Most Way Home and To Repel Ghosts, through Jelly Roll, Black Mariah, and For the Confederate Dead, and on to Dear Darkness and Ardency. And we are all familiar with his powerful reconfigurations as an editor. Giant Steps, Best American Poetry, Jazz Poems, Blues Poems, The Art of Losing, and John Berryman's Selected Poems. But just this month, he is publishing his first book of nonfiction, The Gray Album on the Blackness of Blackness. And it was my great honor to be able to select it for the Gray Wolf Nonfiction Prize. This is a large, capacious achievement that spans America past and present. And one of the most gratifying, if daunting, aspects of choosing the Grey Wolf Nonfiction Prize is that you get to write an afterward. So rather than plagiarize myself in praising the Grey Album, let me quote a few paragraphs from that afterward by way of introducing Kevin. There are terrible spirits, ghosts, in the air of America, D.H. Lawrence announced in studies in classic American literature. Much as Kevin Young, in the Gray Album, On the Blackness of Blackness, summons, quote, a poetry that speaks from the mouths of those gone who aren't really gone, a poetry of ghosts and haunts. Few books of cultural history since Lawrence have dared anything approaching his intellectual adventurousness before America's spectral past. And fewer still have risked Lawrence's stylistic bravura in reclaiming criticism as a form of experimental literature. Here I am thinking of a small, probative tradition of dynamic critical writing as rare and original as William Carlos Williams's in The American Grain, Thomas Beer's The Mauve Decade, Constant Rourke's American Humor, Grill Marcus's Invisible Republic, and most recently, The Gray Album, winner of the Gray Wolf Press Nonfiction Prize. Young's observations in the Gray Album prove as alive and vivid as his vision is expansive, his tonality is generous, and his arguments persuasive. By revisiting, as he says, quote, what I read, heard, and saw at the crossroads of African American and American culture, Young tracks an alternative system of literary currency and value, so to speak, functioning both within and without the dominant supposed gold standard system of American culture. In the personae, disembodied voices, and anonymity of Paul Lawrence Dunbar's poems, for instance, as he says, we have modernism's not so modest beginnings. The 1920 recording of Crazy Blues by Mamie Smith provides the first full expression still overlooked of a black modernist presence previously hinted at by the dialect of Dunbar. T.S. Eliot and Ezra Pound echo Lawrence Louis Armstrong and hip hop folds modernist collage inside out, such that, as he says, the seams are meant to show. R.E. Postmodernism, he writes, we could say that with the cakewalk, as with blackface, white folks projected back onto blacks the kind of pastiche or blank copy that Frederick Jameson saw as one of the fundamental qualities of postmodernism, a full century before the idea took hold. Across his great reckoning, Young finds room for artists as various as Louis Armstrong, Jean-Michel Basquiat, James Brown, Sterling A. Brown, Gwendolyn Brooks, County Cullen, Rita Dove, W.E.B. Du Bois, Paul Lawrence Dunbar, T.S. Eliot, Duke Ellington, Ralph Ellison, Grandmaster Flash, Robert Hayden, Jimi Hendrix, Lauren Hill, Elton John, Langston Hughes, Jay-Z, Fenton Johnson, Robert Johnson, Bob Kaufman, Gladys Knight, Robert Lowell, Claude McKay, Outkast, Charlie Parker, Parliament Funkadelic, NWA, Pablo Picasso, Ezra Pound, Public Enemy, Otis Redding, Run DMC, The Sugar Hill Gang, Phyllis Wheatley, Colson Whitehead, Burt Williams, and Wu-Tang Clan. Rereading the Gray Album, I kept asking, who can't or who won't this radical, far-reaching chronicle take on? Isaac Hayes, David Bowie, The Sex Pistols, Disco. Well, they're all here, as along the way, Young provocatively improvises on such topics as Topeka, Kansas, Muhammad Ali, punk, black bohemia, glamour, space music, and inevitably montage, scat, and story. <laughs> 
His stylist investigations of Wheatley, Hughes, and Kaufman amount to intensive, self-contained nonfiction novellas. Skipping way ahead. Ultimately then, for all its volatile erudition, the Gray Album is a personal, even autobiographical study. I don't only mean Kevin Young's account of the Dark Room Collective and his days as a DJ and WHRB, or the private worlds within such disclosures as, quote, the first record I bought with my own money was King of Rock on vinyl, or Langston Hughes's Big C Changed My Life, but an impulse here at once vaster and bolder. By dividing, conquering, and reconfiguring the tradition, he is showing us how he turned into the poet that he is today. As he implicitly conjures up the gray album in his sly recapitulation of Ralph Ellison, coded languages, storying, and shadow books, it may also provide one map to being a writer. So please join me now in welcoming Kevin Young. Thanks for that. Um, wonderful introduction and uh, the wonderful afterward and for uh, Robert for picking the book. Um, I can't tell you what a joy and pleasure it was to have that happen and um, the Grey Wolf Prize is I think a wonderful prize because it's for work in progress and um, my work was definitely in progress uh, and uh, it really gave me both heart and time to finish this book. <clears throat> So thank you. My uh, sermon tonight is going to be on the blackness of blackness. I thought first I would, uh, we'd have a little selection from the choir. This is a poem called James Brown at B.B. King's on New Year's Eve. James Brown uh, died in December, and he was still scheduled to play that New Year's Eve um, at B.B. King's Club. So I thought, well, what if he showed up? <laughs> James Brown at B.B. King's on New Year's Eve. Begins with a quote from him. The one thing that can solve most our problems is dancing. And sweat, cold or not. And burnt ends of ribs or reason of hair singed and singing. The hot combs caress Days after he dies, I see James Brown still scheduled to play B.B. King's come New Year's Eve, ringing it in us, falling to the floor like the famous glittering midnight ball drop, countdown, forehead full of sweat, please, 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 begging on his knees. The night King was killed, shot by the Memphis moan in a town where B.B. King sang. St. James in Boston tells the crowd, cool it. A riot on stage, heartache rehearsed, practice don't dare be late or miss a note or you'll find yourself fined 50 bucks, a fortune. Even the walls sweat. A godfather's confirmation suit, his holler, wide-collared grits and greens, encore, exhausted, after, collapsed, carried out, away, off, not on a gurney, no bed sheet over his bouffant, conch shining, but boots on in a cape glittering bright as midnight or its train. Well, that's little James Brown. Uh, as Robert mentioned, this book is a large searching work. Um, it starts with uh, this idea of the shadow book and a quote from Sojourner Truth, I sell the shadow to support the substance. She had many cards, uh, carte de visite and things like that. You can see this picture of her um, printed up with that saying. Um, and it was her way of talking about um, I guess the exchange of her image for the ideas behind them. And the book takes on this idea of the shadow book, um, a book that we don't have but know of, a book 
that's haunting us. And I talk a little bit in the introduction about three kinds of these books. The first is an unwritten kind. <clears throat> the second is a removed book, um, a book that existed but that is gone now. And I, I talk about how the first is blues and the second is jazz. And the second book, the removed book, often plays with this idea of improvisation. I thought I'd read you about the last book and um, a little bit of the introduction tonight. The last shadow book is The Lost. These shadow books are at once the rarest and most common, written and now gone. Rather than those never written, these books were lost because their authors' lives were cut too short and because the oral book of black culture is at times not passed down at others simply passed over. Elusive as beauty and as necessary, these lost shadow books include the autobiography of Joe Wood, the complete writings of Philippe Wamba, the lost second book of Philip, Phyllis Wheatley, James Baldwin's no longer extant first book about storefront churches in Harlem, the accidentally burned writings of Fenton Johnson, the purposefully burned writings of Lucille Clifton's mother, and others not so literal, lost to time, from the recording of the sound of Bloody Bolden's horn and the first jazz in New Orleans, and later, in many senses, the actual autobiography of Billie Holiday. These shadow books are what keep me up at night, ghost limbs, books that could be and have been but aren't anymore. I'm reminded of the ways Lucille Clifton made brilliant poems about having been born with extra fingers, polydactyly being a sign of the poet's unique birthright, of something witchy yet lost that is now part of the poetry. The shadow book books go then from the unwritten or untold ones to the removed or unspoken ones, often because they are themselves wordless, to the shadow book as ghost story, disallowed, vanished. Still, at times, such as Hurston and Hughes's mythic collaboration, Mulebone, these lost shadow books turn up. They are invoked, too, by a book like Toni Morrison's Beloved and its idea of rememory, such a process, the willed recovery of what's been lost, often forcibly, I suppose is what keeps me going. In some crucial ways, the lost shadow book is the book that blackness writes every day, the book that memory, time, accident, and the more active forms of oppression prevent from being read. It is this symbolic book that slavery really banned, a book of belief. It is this book we lose daily when the storm sweeps it all away, whenever someone is silenced or an elder dies or is otherwise lost to us, quilts gone out the door, actual books left on the stoop for dead. Not to mention the secret recipes, and I don't just mean for food, that our ancestors managed to keep secret. It is the scrap of paper I found my father's barbecue sauce recipe on, which I'm tempted to frame, but instead, attempted, which I'm tempted to frame, but instead attempted to recreate. It is this reason I found myself a poet and a collector and now a curator to save what we didn't even know needed saving. As African Americans, we have gone over the past century and a half from reconstruction to resistance to recovery and today to a real need for reclamation Forget reparations. We need to rescue aspects of black culture abandoned even by black folks, whether it is the blues or home cooking or broader forms of not just survival, but triumph. So I thought I'd also read you a little of the blues. <clears throat> there are a series of courses in the book. Um, Five. I think when I sent it to Robert, there were four. Um, and uh, they take on sort of music as a representative of certain eras. Um, they go, the book goes from slavery to the present. So one chapter takes on the spirituals, um, another the blues, soul music. So I thought I'd read you uh, some of the blues one. The chapter, the course I should say, is called It Don't Mean a Thing, The Blues Mask and Modernism. The blues contain multitudes, 
Among the last mysteries, blues music resists not only sentimentality, but also easy summary. Just when you say the blues are about one thing, lost love, say, here comes a song about death or about work, about canned heat or loose women. Hard men are harder times to challenge your definitions. Urban and rural, tragic and comic, modern as African America and primal as America, the blues are as innovative in structure as they are in mood. They resurrect old feelings even as they describe them in new ways. They are the definitive statement of that new invention, the African American, though when Langston Hughes first wrote on them and threw them in the 1920s, he felt as much resistance from black folks as white known by black churchgoers as devil's music. The blues are defiant and existential and necessary. Blues singers describe walking with the devil or preaching the blues as Sunhouse did. Yes, I'm a get me religion, I'm a join the Baptist church. Yes, I'm a get me religion, I say I'm a join the Baptist church. You know, I want to be a Baptist preacher so I won't have to work then turn round and sing of John the Revelator. Both the bluesman and the preacher, whose own story often includes being called to the pulpit after a life of sin, know full well that most folks choose both Saturday night and Sunday morning. One, after all, turns into the other. <laughs> Perhaps the best way to describe the blues is to say that they reveal and revel in all our holy and humane contradictions and that this revelatory quality announces itself not with the book of the seven seals, but rather the broken seal on a bottle of whiskey. The same bottle that poison one way or another will leave you barking at the moon. The same bottle that broken you can smooth down the slide over the neck of your guitar. The blues will surely get you, but offer good morning when they do. I thought I want, well, I want to read some to you of uh, one of the chapters about a person. In this case, uh, I thought I'd read about Bob Kaufman, the black beat poet. Um, he uh, was such a hero of mine and uh, of the Darkroom Collective. And this is the beginning of that essay, and it talks a little bit about that. It's called Broken Giraffe. It has this picture across from it of him standing on the street in San Francisco with his arms out like Christ. A picture I used to see in this uh, bookstore I'd go to all the time, and then one day I woke up and I was like, why don't I try to buy that picture? Um, I had no money, but I went and talked to the guy you know, into it. Um, so this is called Broken Giraffe. <clears throat> it's hard to know how to begin talking about Bob Kaufman, poet. Should we talk about his beginnings in New Orleans and his connection to a blues and jazz tradition? His time in the Merchant Marine, which, as he spoke of it, began his vocation as a poet through his reading upon the high seas. Kaufman's wanting to be anonymous and forgotten, or his stance as an oral poet, as a poet who reportedly rarely wrote down his work, which survives as much from others writing it down and rescuing it as his composing it. Perhaps I should begin with my poetic relation to Bob Kaufman, which began, at least in part, with the Dark Room Collective. The Boston-based Black Writers Collective I was a member of starting in the early 1990s. In parentheses, it says, once in, you're in forever. Um, I should say here that there is a Dark Room reunion, actually, this year, um, and we're coming to various places. Um, so. I was right. Um, <laughs> founded in 1989, the collective was interested in black culture and history and the preservation of both, hosting readings and recording interviews with established and emerging black writers before emerging became just another stick without much of a carrot. For us, Bob Kaufman was an avatar of sorts, an incarnation of poetry in what may be called its purest form, perhaps most accurately its most useful in pure form, complete with a sense of music and line that can be hard to find. Rare, but not rarefied. I have a t-shirt somewhere, hand-drawn, that reads, The Dark Room, with Kaufman's golden sardine, inked in yellow, swimming below it. 
Kaufman's sense of poetry's immediacy, its performative qualities, his mix of speech and surrealism appealed to us. He was one of the few people I know who could append the phrase poet after his name, which is what he did in a poem letter reprinted at the end of his second book and have it stick. He was so dedicated to poetry that he didn't write it down. He was so much a poet that he committed a vow of silence for over 10 years from Kennedy's assassination to the end of the Vietnam War. While others were out in the street protesting or in a VW van dropping out and dropping acid, Kaufman was silent, which is one kind of crucial protest, perhaps the most crucial. For now, let's stick with what Bob Kaufman meant to me as a young poet, which was plenty. Thinking back on it, my internalized sense of what the important theme should be comes in part from Bob Kaufman. Music and silence and noise was my recent answer to an interviewer asking what I thought my own themes were. And in rereading Kaufman, I see the presence of all three in his multiple musical selves. I should say I've tried writing on Kaufman before, even getting a small grant while in college in the summer of 1991 to consider his legacy. With its $500, I went to San Francisco, where Kaufman spent most of his adult life, with the full intent of interviewing folks who knew him. After crashing with friends in Oakland, most of whom are fairly well known today, rotating off the futon in a Berkeley apartment with four other guys while staying with a generous house sitter for a pot dealer for the Bay Area who was off making some deals, I ended up with an August sublet shared with four stinky cats and two guys I didn't know. One nice, one something of a racist. Once, <clears throat> when I complained about the rats that would sometimes scratch below the fool boards all night, he mentioned they might nest in my dreads, implying they did already. I lived in what was called the Lower Hate, but used to be the Fillmore, the lively black neighborhood and street that stretched north from Hate, a Hate Street and below and east of what became Hate Ashbury, and that had been urban renewed mostly out of existence by the 1970s. A highway running through the neighborhood meant replacing black businesses with housing projects and the working poor with crack. By the time I got there, there were some divey reincarnated bars and a few artists, more accurately slackers, though it was still dangerous enough that one night I was nearly mugged on my corner, and strange enough that sitting in one of our favorite hangouts, Hotel Casa Loma, uh, it was like a residency hotel with a bar below it, you could see more than your share of fights and car crashes. I think I saw two sitting there. A few years ago during the dot-com boom, I went back to Lower Haight, and there were SUVs parked on a curb in the neighborhood, and some young lower, lawyer house party that left the door to her apartment wide open. I couldn't bear it, so stood outside pretending to be a bouncer and asked the young esquires for IDs. <laughs> it's amazing how many of them showed them. <laughs> I think everyone did. Um, that summer, I enjoyed living in a traditionally, though not necessarily traditional, black neighborhood no matter how different lower hate had grown. In feeling, if not fact, it seemed not so different from the Mattapan my aunt and uncle had lived in since the 1960s, and that, was a, and that was a refuge from ivy towers come holidays and wherever I needed one. That was the summer of MC Breed and DFC's Ain't No Future in Yo Frontin', a forgotten hip-hop classic whose Middle Eastern sample proved a rather regular, if welcome, alarm clock ringing from passing cars. If I had to name the somewhere I lived, it was that roving neighborhood, Bohemia. This I suppose I shared, albeit superficially, with Kaufman, and later with Basquiat, whom I began to write about soon after. But I didn't think of it that way then. I was simply living the life I hoped might lead me to a life of writing. It was enough to share the same air Kaufman had once breathed. Black bohemia, like black surrealism, is a topic that deserves more and more better written about it. Race, I suppose, is what some think isn't discussed in bohemia, though that was exactly not my experience. One reason black bohemia is rarely discussed or discussed well, as it is, say, in How I Became Hetty Jones by Hetty Jones, is that it gets into questions that have more traditionally been addressed by the black expatriate. Perhaps expatriate life is where thinking about black bohemia begins, with literary exiles like Baldwin, Richard Wright, and Du Bois, not to mention jazz musicians from Ada Bricktop Smith to Dexter Gordon. <laughs> 
Bohemia may be the solution for a younger self, expatriatism for the older. Bohemia is what it often, sorry, Bohemia is often what is being rejected by black folks as they progress towards self-imposed exile, whether moving uptown as Baraka did, or bra to Paris, and then literally Timbuktu, like Ted Jones. We might remember here that Jones used to be a beatnik for hire, a brilliant spoof on the artificiality of identity and the commodification of both blackness and the beat generation. It also earned him a few bucks. In this, it is the counterfeit made flesh, and I use counterfeit in the book to talk about um, a certain tradition of lying and improv improvisation. His rent a beatnik providing partygoers both a laugh and a bit of frisson. The fiction of his belonging, of his, not being, of his being not invited, as was sometimes chic to do, but hired, makes him more than help, while also parodying it. But returning to expatriatism, self-exile may seem redundant for the black writer, or perhaps it's a case of rejecting Bohemia before it rejects you, whether from the natural limits of artistic community or the painful limits of a perceived America. Yet as Langston Hughes or any other number of artists point out, black community and Bohemia community, Bohemian community overlap, confront, complement, distract, ignore, and often are no different from each other. The life of the jazz musician is just one example of a life without labels, but not without race. Certainly, it seems, Bohemia never meant the absence of blackness for Kaufman, and as Kaufman's work is, inf as Kaufman's work is infused with blackness, which is to say, music and silence and noise. Thought I'd end with some, some noise, uh, some hip hop. <coughs> Don't worry, I won't rap or anything. <laughs> this is only the second time I've read from this book, so I appreciate your um, patience and listening. I think I'll read um, from this section. Um, which is uh, sort of about, I start the book, I'm mean, the hip hop chapter, which is called Planet Rock, about some of the, this idea of lostness. Uh, I say hip hop is in love with lostness. It's always looking for a haystack and a needle. And this idea of lostness comes to bear in some of its uh, use of what I call collage. Um, so th I'll just read this these two little sections, I think. Um, this one, first one's called Cut Creator. Hip hop has fulfilled a view of the black artist as collagist begun in the blues, now reappropriating materials from music that originated in African American culture. What's my DJ's name? <coughs> Cut Creator. The music sought to show and prove that it ain't a question of using the master's tools to dismantle the master's house, but of what you do with your skills, taking your beats and rhythms from anywhere the street, mainstream culture, dirt roads, obscure records, seemingly incongruous cultures, and ultimately from your own flow, and rhyming over them. It ain't where you're from, it's where you're at. With hip hop, we have a full sense of the fragment of meaning produced by juxtapositions of disparate elements. The mashup may be the post-soul artist's chief method of madness, not just combining things that heretofore we didn't know went together, but also making things masquerading as other things. In the post-soul lexicon, mad, after all, is a compliment. To perform, to render, to riff, to plunder. These are the post-soul artist's chief means. Where Eliot's wasteland owed some of its rhythms to jazz and St. Louis, and Pound's ideogrammatic method, the grammar of black soldiers, in imprisoned in Pisa. I have a part where I talk about Pound's recording uh, in the Pisa and Cantos, the talk of black soldiers. Not to mention the written Chinese language, however, misread. Hip hop took such juxtapositions as its very base. We think of the key, each in his prison. Thinking of the key, each confirms a prison. Reading Eliot's and Pound's long poems now in a hip hop fashion may help us hear that them less as echoes of other texts 
than his new originals, a pleasing, if jarring, sonic patchwork. As in hip hop, we need not get every reference or sample. Rather, even the footnotes of the wasteland become another poetic form, realized later by Langston Hughes's own Ask Your Mama, whose liner notes for the unhip are prose poems of a sort that do not actually annotate, but extend the long poem to the very edges of the record. And I love this idea of the edges of the record, which is sort of the subtitle of that part of the book, the Planet Rock chapter. Um, Cornell West says that he hates it when, I read an interview that he said that he hated when DJs turned down the ends of you know, soul records, because that's where they would improvise, where they would riff and get to go to church, as it were. And um, so I make sort of much of this. I'll skip ahead a little bit. <clears throat> the third coming. Well, let me read this little part. How does hip hop collage differ from the riffing montages found in the jazz aesthetic or the transformative aesthetic found in soul? Hip hop takes these fragments in their original found form. The fragments in hip hop are not necessarily shored up against the ruins, but less left as representative of it. Often these breaks never unify, remaining comfortably or uncomfortably discreet, distant, and difficult to discern. It's not where the fragments are from, but where they now are at. The freeze, pop lock, the backspin, the scratch, these innovations were ways of testing and extending the tradition, of highlighting the here and now and the new kinds of hearing hip hop sought, building its melody around the break. If funk is indeed the intrusion of the past upon the present, no wonder what we might call the gangster or G-funk era used funk music to define a certain OG or original gangster quality. But gangster rap took funk's groove for its own also to provide the feel, or better yet, the illusion of smoothness, which made its nihilism more terrifying, not less. Through such a patchwork, hip hop reenacted not only its own history, but the history of modern music, which is to say black music, only in reverse. First disco, then funk, then heavy metal, reggae, and soul, all were sampled in their turn. But this ignores the many ways and means hip hop moves sideways and roundabout through the past, looping as a form of longing. You could say that the sound of the break was the search for history. I say it is the sound of history itself. This longing is nostalgia, certainly, but also recovery, remembrance as totem, as fetish. Not just repetition, but repast, the meal after sending off who or what's gone. There are mournful turns and tones behind the music that aren't just the blues, but that live in hip hop's very structure. The blues fight the feeling of the blues. Their descendant hip hop mourns that feeling, and even that is missing. In hip hop, something or someone is always missing. Thanks very much. That's fantastic. Oh, thanks. That was great. It's a nice audience, so. Yeah. I, I think it was especially good that you read some of those passages because I think we can watch the some of the ways in which you put the book together. And I wonder if we might start by talking a, a little bit about that. Because it sure. seems to me that in each of the passages that you read, there was a kind of image for the book that you were, that you were writing at the same time. So like that discussion of hip hop at, at the end there, or the way that collage works in the blues, or, or even some of the, the remarks you're making about Kaufman and these kind of lost stories, and then going all the way back to the shadow book. Because this, this is a kind of shadow book in, in, in some ways. And I'm, I'm wondering if you might talk a little bit about the process of putting the book together from the, from the perspective of if there was a center for you as you were working on it, what was the center? Well, uh, it was a long process. Um, I probably started, you know, the first murmurings of some of these ideas years and years ago. Um, I hate to say how long. But um, I think it came together for me when I started thinking about lying. Um, and the book once had a subtitle that sort of talked about lying, but now I just talk about it. Um, so, but the gospel of lying is one of the things I was interested in because I, you think you see so much about authenticity and you know what things are 
really trying to say. And um, it seems to me hip hop is a great example of the real being just really important, um, but also really far from actually what the music is doing. Um, though I got to that last, you know. So I started with this idea of, of lying, I suppose, and I was really riding around it and around it, and um, at one point I thought I would have a lot of sort of little bits that I had already written, um, prefaces and things, mm. um, but it just wasn't sort of gelling, and it was really only when um, I heard someone read to me uh, that p part I read about, about the shadow book that I realized that's what the book was about. Um, and, um, you know, I had sort of been working in secrecy about this. You know, it's hard to, uh, if you're a poet, to decide you're going to write a massive uh, prose book. Um, and uh, if you're anyone, I suppose. Um, so I, uh, it was really, a, a, I hadn't realized I had written that about the shadow book, because at one point it was really buried in the middle yeah. of the book and moving it to the front and deciding that was sort of the framework and that I could refer to it, but I didn't have to make it, it's a very loose book in that way that I didn't have to keep going back and saying, by the way, on page two, I proved um, yeah. this. Um, I, let me sort of talk about these different ideas. Um, and the, it always had that musical structure. And at one time it had, um, the choruses were like three pages. Um, and since now they're the longest parts of the book, um, they sort of, the book kind of inverted. I think I thought the choruses would kind of mark time and sort of get us to think about, say, postmodernism and jazz. But there seemed to be a lot more to say about it. Um, and so I ended up making those much longer and ended up having just these kind of portraits of, excuse me, various writers um, throughout, uh, whether it's Dunbar or Rita Dove or Bob Kaufman. Um, and that structure seemed to work and help me. Um, and lastly, uh, the title, it had a different title. And it was really when I decided that it was called The Gray Album that it became a book. Um, mm -hmm. And um, it's funny how titles can do that. Oh, yeah, they can. Have that magic, can, you know. They can kind of galvanize something. Yeah, because like, yeah. I suddenly knew, oh, OK, it has this uh, precedent. And I had known uh, Danger Mouse just a little in, in Athens, where I lived. I remember meeting him, and he was just like a little genius who worked at the record store. And I was like, he's so smart. Um, yeah. And he, in fact, told me a couple things to put in uh, Giant Steps, because I had a list of hip hop in the back. So I, uh, I ran out and bought his little CD. He would make mixtapes. Um, and I have some signed Danger Mouse mixtapes, which I'm proud of. Um, you know, I, I was thinking today that there's, there's a way in which Giant Steps is also a rough draft of, of this book. And, in some ways, I mean, the, yeah. even like like you alluded to Joe Wood, which is one of the great you know essays in that, yeah. in that book. Would you would we talk a little bit about the connections between the two books? And that's a great and question. For those who don't know Giant Steps, maybe say a little bit about what it is. Yeah, it was a book I edited in uh, 2000 um, after my first book, and I had sort of uh, thought of it as a kind of new Negro, the anthology from the 20s for the current day. Um, there. Are, then came out after that a few other, um, there was a sort of series of young black writers, but I really wanted it to be, there's only I think 25 writers, um, and I really want it to be across genres, so I want it to be poets and nonfiction writers and um, fiction writers. I would have loved to have had playwrights too, but really a um, slice of sort of what people are writing now. And in, it, in the opening, uh, the essay, I really talked about what they were trying to do, how they were as I say, conversating with each other. And um, one of the things they were doing, I think, is talking about post-soul and this hip-hop aesthetic, which took from it anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of those writers, uh, like Colson Whitehead, Natasha Trethaway, um, you know, uh, really have done quite well, and Danzy Senna's in mm -hmm. there. Um, and they were already doing well, and that was sort of my point, is that they weren't about to get good, they were good. Um, and there was also, at the time, you know, this kind of, the Atlantic every, uh, is it like three years, they run a thing about what's new in fiction, or yeah. fiction's dead, yeah. or, um, and they had- Fiction's one, back. Yeah, fiction's yeah. back. I yeah. think it was fiction's back cycle, <laughs> and there were no black people in it, yeah. you know? And I was like, well, if you're talking, I mean, you don't know what fiction yeah. is if you're ignoring these people. So it was sort of a, a lot of different things at once that I wanted to get in, and then I threw in these, this music at the, at the end, which I think confused people. Um, but that's good, too. Yeah. And I think one of the links for me is, is these, these stories that you thought you knew that turns out that you didn't know. And it seems to me that that's one of the 
the, I think the, the powerful legacies of this book. I mean, because I think another way of looking at the book is that it's, a, it, it's an alternate history of modernism. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the modernism wasn't just Ezra Pound and T.S. Eliot and Gertrude Stein, that it was, but it was Robert Johnson and Phyllis Wheatley and, and Paul Dunbar. And uh, how, how, much, how much of that was crucial to the writing of the book right from the start or? Well, the blues chapter, I, you know, I had done a book of blues poems mm -hmm. that I wrote. Then I edited a book called Blues Poems of other people. And I thought I was sort of done with the blues. And I always had this kind of, I knew I had to do something about it. But that was the hardest chapter for me, just to sit down and, and go back in. Um, but I found that there was a lot more to say and that they provided such a great model as other p people have explored. But I, I felt like was still oddly ignored um, as a model, not just for literature, but of modernism. And um, you know, there's this giant study uh, called Modernism, and I talk about it in the essay. And there's li it's like 800 pages, and there's no black person yeah. mentioned in it. Yeah. Um, and there's this, so this idea of mo black folks not being modern is sort of an interesting one to me. And so I started writing about that. And the blues were really a crucial engine for my own work. And um, I sort of ended we're thinking about a blues correlative, like this thing out in the world that um, described, say, a train used to describe, you know, heartbreak yeah. or, or freedom or escape, all those things that are themes in African American culture. So um, I had sort of already tried that unwittingly, I think, in Jelly Roll, my blues book. Because, um, you know, when you, the nice thing yeah. about a blues song is you don't have to say, by the way, you know, lady. Uh, X, I miss you because of that. You just say the train left, you know, yeah. um, and so that's that was really the shorthand or the kind of um, set of stored imagery I want to bring to our attention. Much of which Eliot and Pound and these other modernists took for their own. I mean, they very much yeah. wrote about blackness. But I think one of the interesting things is that you, you you took that story back, you know, in back in time to these mm. to these earlier poets. Yeah. You know? You know, who are often just thought of as dialect poets or something. Like well, yeah, Dunbar, Wheatley is yeah. dismissed as a kind yeah. of sellout, you know. Um, and I think the point for me was how do you expect in Wheatley a private thoughts in a public poetry? She was writing a public poetry. What does it do yeah. on its own terms? And so I was really, you know, talking about it, the shadows it cast were just as important for that and for uh, Dunbar as well. Um, so there were a lot of linkages I wanted to make. Um, and uh, also not just the literature over here and the music over here, but that these things were together. Yeah, I mean, I, I think one of the astonishments of the book is that all of these things are just on a, on a continuum. You know, for all the departures and that, you know, th that, that list of names that I, that I read, it's astonishing that all those could be in, right. in, in one book. But they, but they very much feel on a, on, on a continuum. And, I wonder if we could talk, r return to that notion of storying, you know, you were mm -hmm. calling lying a minute ago, and, and, and how you see that as moving through the, the different phases of the book. Well, I talk in the book about um, lying, and, um, you know, in Louisiana, you couldn't say to, like, a grown person, you are lying, you know. Um, you would say, your story, you story, you would say. And so I took this idea, uh, this vernacular idea, and tried to expand on it, and I see it in these other aspects, including the jazz tradition, where um, I tell an anecdote about this idea of telling your own story. That's what a solo, a jazz solo yeah. does. And that, you know, Louis Armstrong, that's his innovation, really, I think, yeah. is that his stories, A, were much better, and B, that they were, you know, not uh, brief. They were just lyrical and, and amazing. And um, so that's kind of these both poles of, of uh, the African American mm -hmm. tradition of lies as being folk tales, and then also this tradition of storying uh, from Louis Armstrong is what I sort of uh, take on, both in the style of the book, I hope, um, mm -hmm. but also as a subject through all these different yeah. figures. You know, it's funny when you were reading that list. Uh, I, it amazes me just because yeah, no, I didn't get the index till later. Uh, I wish I'd had the index first somehow yeah. because. No, because parts of it have like a, a, a what's wrong with this picture quality to it, you know, like when you've got these, the, these list of names, like yeah. the, the people that are, end up kind of alphabetically to, together. Um, w w were there models that you had for the, for the book as you were writing it, or, is, or was it pretty much its own thing? 
Um, there were various models. Um, I'm not sure there was one model. Um, you know, there were figures who, for me, were so important. Probably uh, Baldwin, Sontag. Yeah. You know, people you might imagine. If you want to sit down an essay, you know, it's sort of like you sit down and write a poem. Whitman, right. Shakespeare, you know, you don't necessarily have to say them. But for me, I also, you know, there's a writer like Melvin Dixon, um, also not known mm. as well as he should be, but he has a wonderful book called Ride Out the Wilderness where he talks about geography and these various mm. geographies, the valley, the mountaintop. And um, those really were profound for me, um, thinking about... Mm the ways that black folks in slavery recast the American landscape. You know, they told these stories where I use the spirituals as an example of storying, where it's saying one thing but meaning another. Um, and this coded black art of escape is, really became probably the driving engine, just thinking about what you were asking before. And um, I just started seeing it in all these other forms. And, and um, the last thing was to be written was the hip hop chapter, which I, had sort of, I had sort of just ended like five minutes before hip hop started, which seemed, or five minutes after, and it yeah. didn't seem right, and I had to go back in and write this. No, from what you were saying before, though, like, hip hop is also where it kind of started in some, <laughs> in some way, right? But it was, well, it was yeah, left I mean, out certainly the with early, the title. But, yeah. Um, but, you know, I had written all the whole book before I had ever written a word about what the title meant. Um, and I think that was good for me, um, as opposed to a sort of book that started with the title and said, you know, this is what I'm trying to prove. It really made me write it instead of prove it, if you know what I mean. It's also a book that's profoundly about loss, and that and that I think very much came across in the readings. You know, like you, like you started with the with these lost books and these lost stories and these lost figures, but then the way that that loss just kept coming back and the other things that you read. I mean, how how much was that deliberate right from the start? A hundred percent. No, um, I don't know. You know, I think it emerged. Um, I was very aware when I got to the hip hop chapter, but I don't think, you know, I think it's just something that um, I see at work, sure. um, and um, you know, in a way, it's a book as as the opening said about reclamation, yeah. and how do you reclaim things that you don't even know are lost? And um, well, like the history of modernism. Yes, right. yes. Right. right. Yeah. Like it's yeah. a, yeah. excuse me, something that's, you know, well, I don't know that that's not there. Right. And you can look in these books and not see yourself and think, well, that's just how it was. Um, and, um, you know, being an, uh, someone who works in a library, I'm also a curator of a large poetry library and, and getting collections. I just see things that amaze me, you know, and I, that's what I love about that part of the job is, yeah. Finding out things I didn't know, um, and um, and I actually am not the African American collections uh, curator, which is sort of uh, nice in a way yeah. because then I, I sometimes find African American material certainly, but I also am looking f across this large, vast tradition and and trying to and African Americans are a large part of that. So yeah. um, you know, one of the points of the book uh, was that I wasn't trying to answer the question, you know, how white is black culture, which really was a question if you read things about Dunbar, you know, they're really talking, he was the first full-blooded Negro, you know, there's very much a kind of, his achievement is, is being discussed in racialized terms, Claude McKay, all these, these writers experience that, um, but really sort of more like Ralph Ellison's question, what would America be like without blacks, which is to say how central yeah. African American culture is. But by the end, I realized I was really at this idea of the blackness of blackness. You in, know. In, in framing American culture as black culture by, yes. by the end of the book. Yeah. Well, and then also yeah. I want to know what was black about black culture by the end. Um, and so that's where I sort of ended up, I think, by the time I get to the soul chapter. If you want to skip there, you can. Um, but and That's yeah, one of the great chapters in the, in the book. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Um, let's see. Um, how, did, how did you... Um, how did you decide what to put in, what to leave out? I mean, that's a, that's the flip side of that kind right. of long list. I mean, because because did I leave something some, out? Yeah, they, well, no, I mean, or, or, no, but, but no. there had to have been something that that you left out that you said, oh, I I, I don't want to go there, or yeah, or well, I, I don't need were, to go there. There or, was more stuff about, um, you know, this kind of uh, about white writers. I mean, I don't know how else to describe them. Um, 
riders, you know, so the only thing that's really left is Pound mm -hmm. and uh, Lowell. But, you know, I've written mm -hmm. on Berryman, who I think is so engaged in these oh, issues, absolutely. and I just yeah. sort of left him out. And um, partially because I had written on him, but partially because I think I wanted to focus the book in this certain way. I had to leave out visual art. <laughs> there was a moment when I thought, I'll write about art, you know. And Romare Bearden would seem yeah, to be the Yes, I'm, there's I'm many an chapter, artist. Yeah. And in fact, I love the cover is uh, Jenny C. Jones, a great artist. She um, does these drawings with audio tape under glass. And then um, this one is taken from a series uh, called Breathless based on a Kenny G uh, tape. That she found. So she took her taking part Kenny G and putting it, you know, I just loved that. And um, so uh, that's the kind of aesthetic I only could, you could glimpse. Um, and then I ended up using photographs throughout the book pretty mm -hmm. l last minute, but I think just to anchor visually mm -hmm. what is a long book. W was there ever a version of the book that had more of yourself in it or less of yourself? Because I mean, I, th I think there is a there is a very powerful way, which is it's a kind of deflected autobiography. You know? Yeah. And, but with just enough kind of personal passages in it, right. like the black, you know, like like the, like the collective, the dark, the dark. Um, yeah. House collective. Anyway. That uh, that probably was the um, breakthrough in the personal part. You know, um, was writing the Kaufman essay, which really was started as a talk, and so thinking about Bob Kaufman who meant so much to me, but mm. I couldn't tell you exactly why. Um, that was really one of the important things, but I didn't want it to be a memoir in the traditional sense. Um, I did like what you had to say about it being, how to come to being a writer, which I don't think I was fully aware of. Um, but there's a big, long opening called How Not to Be a Slave. Yeah. Um, and that's really when I was wrestling with those kind of questions of the tradition, and what do you keep, and what do you carry, and what do you keep in your pocket, and, um, how do you let it go? And that was an important, if not manifesto, then a kind of manifestation of this, this impulse of yeah. how do you be a writer? You know, how do you, what do you take? Uh, yeah. And what do you take for granted? All those kinds of questions that I think you ask yourself when you sit down to write. And, um, you know, I think all of us have faced the shadow book in some way. You know, that's what faces you when you sit down on the page is that yeah. thing you can't write. Absolutely. And so that's why, you know, and for a long time this was a book I couldn't write in some sense, but I was always writing it. So well, and that Kaufman chapter that you read it even contains that. Like you had a grant to go write this book that you right. never wrote you yeah. know, about him. And then this in that and that's another way in which this is a shadow right, is right. a shadow book. Well and he's so great because he, you know, this vow of silence he, he took is so profound. I mean not talking for 10, I mean, you know, yeah. 10 minutes. I don't, you know, can people do that anymore? Um, my son can't. Um, you know, 10 seconds. So, I mean, I, I think that that silence, though I remember asking someone about it and he said, well, only just to come up to you, he would only say, come up to you to ask you for drugs, you know. Um, and I, I sort of, you know, just, I sort of threw it in there because I think it was important to know it wasn't a pure yeah. thing, but it was a true thing. Because yeah, when I was thinking of this as being like, at the end of the introduction, like this this kind of, you know, map to becoming a writer, I, w I was thinking of the the interesting connection between y your role as a curator and a, a reclaimer of things, and then creating new work out of those impulses. Because that's often kind of seen as a static thing. You just bring something back into print, right. or or you you buy something for the for the library and it's there on on the shelf. But it, but it seems that this book is really all about people taking something forward and making something out of the, the past. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Well, I mean, I think that's what the tradition does. I mean, when you're in the tradition, you're acting on the tradition, you know, and, and um, sometimes you're in a you don't even know you're in it. Um, and I think that that, yeah. sometimes you find your ancestors well after, and sometimes they're siblings, sometimes, you know, um, there's lots of uh, ways yeah. it can happen, I guess. Um, the way hip hop sort of allowed you to read Dunbar and Wheatley in a different way. Yeah. One Pound and yeah. um, Elliot. Yeah. I guess also, uh, I love how hip hop, you know, it's, I, it took me, you know, a number of pages to nail it down, so I shouldn't attempt to sum it up, but I feel like there's a, there's a real quality of not just looping, um, but, you know, the cipher circling back nostalgia all those things that are represented by just taking, 
lost samples. You know, your sample, your goal is to sample this yeah. kind of stuff that the more obscure the better in some sense, or at least um, before, you know, lawsuits. Um, since the lawsuits, I think hip hop is less adventurous um, out of necessity, yeah. but, you know, you listen to early, even just golden age hip hop, you really hear some wild stuff um, that I think I really miss and, and want it to kind of reclaim as well. Yeah. Are there any questions out, out here? If you could say them very loudly, because okay, this is being filmed. So yeah. um, is there any book in relation to the title of the book, to the Joan Didion book, The White Album? Um, I was aware of that book um, very much. Um, I didn't really make much of it, but I do love in that essay, the specific White Album essay, how she manages to kind of elusively capture this both time and feeling, the, this kind of tone of the times changing. And she ties it all to sort of herself and her yeah. needs um, for leaving. But you know, I think that's a really powerful essay in that way. Um, and of course, the White Album is behind the Gray Album. Yes, of course. Of course. So yeah, I was yeah. interested. And I, you know, I, I knew the Gray Album more than I knew the White Album. So, um, by, I mean, the music musically, yeah. and so I, I, you know, and I also talk about Prince's Black Album, you know, which I think was a great sort of shadow book of its yeah. own. So, there were all those things were at play. Um, but like I said, I didn't even address the Gray Album till the very end, um, and I don't really address the White Album by Joan Didion. Yes. Um, so I'm not sure if I just pulled this out. It's always dangerous to try to take things out of the context of how they were written. But um, when you were talking, thank you so much, by the way. Hearing you read this is so delightful. I almost wish it came with a soundtrack when you're doing the whole thing. <laughs> wow. So really, your poetry book, that's yeah. is awesome. <laughs> um, but when you were talking about your father's barbecue recipe mm -hmm. and how you were tempted to frame it, but attempted to recreate it. It seems to me that what you are doing with this book is actually the opposite, that you are attempting to frame what has been recreated. And then you spoke later of not just survival, but triumph. And that recreation and, and the looping as a form of longing, et cetera, has been a method of survival. But what you are doing is, in some ways, it seems to me with this, and correct me if I'm wrong, please, is trying to frame it so that it can move beyond that. And, and it's an amazing effort. I can't wait to read it. Oh, well, thanks. Can you do a blurb for me or something uh, Rob, below Robert? Um, I think uh, that's a good way of putting it. I, I think that, you know, in some ways, I, I felt like I was sort of offering this taxonomy. And then in the book, there's a moment when I say, I don't mean to taxonomize, but rhapsodize, you know? Mm -hmm. And I, I really think there's a certain quality that I wanted that was that, you know? Not just listing or, or name, you know, naming, which I think is very important and certainly part of the tradition, but also to rhapsodize about it and say, this is what is so great, or this is how I feel um, hearing this, seeing this, thinking this, reading that. So that's, that's kind of how I would sort of think about that framing, but that's a great um, take on it. Must be other questions. Could you talk a little bit about um, when you were writing, did you write any sections that um, got really excited about and produced a lot of pages and then realized later you had to go back and like, cut them down? If you did, how did you deal with that? <laughs> uh, the question was, did I write sections that I got excited about that I had to cut, and what did I do? Um, it is like 500 pages, so um, I did cut, but um, uh, I don't know. I, I, it was also a book of kind of plenty, you know, in some ways. Um, it had to be good, what I kept, but... Um, I was really interested in this idea of plenty, and I talk about it a little bit in terms of um, Charlie Parker and his horn, um, and what was coming out of his horn was plenty. Um, so I think in many ways I erred on the side of inclusiveness, um, and really the difficulty was finding structure. That said, I wrote um, the hip hop chapter last, like I was saying, and it really was like one big riff in a sense, and I almost lost it. It was sort of the opposite of what you're saying, which is that my computer died. 
I went to turn it on, I usually back up and I'm really good. And I've been on a roll, so I hadn't. And it just wah, wah, wah. And it was like 100 pages, you know? And I thought, oh, I'll never rewrite that. And I went to the uh, Mac store, then I could see it. Um, and just uh, pleaded with them to dump it on a hard drive, which I did. Um, and funny enough, I lost, you know, later, not the same computer, another computer did the same thing. And I lost all that. So it just uh, was a lucky fortune that I had it. Um, and I guess that was sort of, it was almost, it, at that point in the book, it was almost like imp improvisational. So in a sense, it wasn't like so much cutting as trying to ride that wave out. You know what I mean? And so the things I left out by the end were things I just knew I wasn't going to address rather than um, things that I wrote and then chopped off. But yeah, there's, there's a cutting room floor, of course. Yeah, in the back. Um, I'm thinking about the San Francisco section. And uh -huh. um, just to get your take on this, because in New York and Brooklyn and in Harlem, the black folks are the ones as well gentrifying the neighborhood. So your opinion on what is blackness now? Now? Right. So that lower income folks are being displaced, and mm -hmm. you've got these black folks moving in. So just to get your thoughts on Well, I don't live in those places, sadly. so. Um, I couldn't exactly refer to you that way. I mean, I live in Atlanta, excuse me, which has its own set of, of things. And gentrific the thing about Atlanta and sort of the dirty South, I think, is that it's side by side. You know, there's not, it's block to block, really. Um, and that's a little like San, San Francisco was. I lived in the Mission later, and the Mission is, would gentrify and then not, and, you know, um, so I'm more used to that situation. I, I, it sounds different. I did just read um, Harlem is Nowhere by uh, Sharifa Rhodes Pitts, um, who I knew back in the day. But, um, and I, I think it's a tremendous book about some of those questions. Um, and I would more ask her those questions than me, just because I, I don't live there. But um, it's an interesting you know, proposition about these questions. Because of course, and I think even in Bohemia, class comes up or doesn't come up. Um, so I think there's a lot of that going on too. Yes, sir. Writing something as large as this book um, and having coming out from a poetry being kind of your primary writing, or what did it do to your poetry um, while you're writing, um, after you finished writing it itself? I mean, how did you find that it had an influence on it, or did it change the structure or the style of how you were writing your poetry before, during, or after? Well, that's a great question. I think it would have more of an effect moving forward for me. Um, in a way, it took some pressure off things I wanted to say. You know, the nice thing about the essay is you can say things outright that you might be tempted to work into a poem, like a theory. Um, and that's not a good thing, I, I don't think. Um, which isn't to say poems don't have ideas, but you know, I, I, they have to have a music to them, right? So um, for me, it was, that was sort of what happened during it. I was also working on uh, this long poem, Ardency, that came out a year ago about um, the Amistad Rebellion. Um, and I can see more uh, correlations with that, trying to wrestle with a large structure, trying to get down the kind of musical structure that both books have quite separately. Um, and in that book, Ardency, I was really wrestling with the spiritual. Um, and how does that form work? And how do I have, you know, can I not write about it, but write it? And, um, you know, what connected them, I think, in the end was, was the ways in which <clears throat> Ardency, which was a book I started, you know, 20 years ago, um, was about the Amistad Rebellion in the sense that it was from their voices. And there's a series of letters they wrote from jail. And in those letters, I see a lot of sort of codes and, double talk and out of necessity. You know, they're writing in jail. They don't, they were trying to get home. They're saying, please send us home. Um, but at the same time, there's, you know, just wholesale saying, you know, bits of Bible verse. And, and uh, it's amazing sort of um, letters. I mean, the originals that I base my poems on. And so I can see that kind of urge for freedom, um, both artistic and um, literal in both the, the books. And you're, you've often been someone who writes 
books of poems as books, which is another yeah. connection kind of with this too. And then also been someone who, as you were just describing, the process of writing the long poem doesn't mind looking things up and <laughs> reading things in order to write new Don't poems. Don't all poets do yeah. that? I mean, I, I, yeah. the ones I know and love yeah. do. Yeah. Um, but you, you know, the difference is in, in a, a poem, you research just enough to, yeah. you can't do too much. And a book like this, there is a point where you have to stop reading. Um, but I took it pretty far. Any other questions? Let me ask you one more question. Yes. And it's, it's, it's actually kind of one of more of those bookstore questions rather than the kind of questions okay. I've, been, I've been asking. I was, I was wondering if there was a, a CD at the back of this book of, of essential listening, essential songs that everybody in this room should, yes. should hear, what, what, would be some, what would be on that CD? It's funny because I did make two CDs, um, two playlists, I should say, because by then it was playlists, yes. of um, that very thing. I can't remember what's on them, um, in all honesty. But I think they had two different motions. One was a kind of rising motion, one was a falling motion. Um, certainly Ezekiel saw the wheel was on there, some uh, Robert Johnson, but I also love Mamie Smith's Crazy Blues, um, a song that some blues purists would dismiss, but I, I make much of it. Um, I love, uh, I always get the title wrong, how can it all be so simple by Wu Tang, mm -hmm. which samples um, Gladys Knight um, doing the way we were, um, which I think is just an amazing uh, moment of mm -hmm. you know not just reclamation but sort of proximity and changing a thing um, utterly, which Gladys Knight herself is doing, and that was sort of my point in the Soul chapter. So those are just a few of the things you can probably glean it from reading the book yeah. um, itself. But I actually may post them. Uh, oh, that would be great. Yeah, we might do something with Tin House, so. Fantastic. Yeah, you can see them literally. Okay, so please join me now in thanking Kevin Young. Thanks for a lot. Thank you, guys. Thanks. Okay.